everyone, my name is, is Mike Day. It's really, really good to be with you this morning, Mike Day, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Mike Day. And uh, it's such a privilege to be in a church that celebrates and honors the presence of God. It really, really is refreshing to me. I spend a lot of time uh, on the road in places where people are, uh, have quite a lot of hostility towards faith and uh, asking lots of questions about faith. So it's good sometimes just to be with the people of God to celebrate the presence of God and step into that and enjoy it. So thank you for blessing me with, uh, with your worship and your pursuit of God this morning. It's incredibly encouraging and refreshing. Thank you to Louis and Edna for having me and for hosting me and uh, to this incredible team that uh, does what they do to make this all happen. So thank you for having me. Thank you for hosting me. Uh, I arrived yesterday uh, from quite a busy season. There's been a lot going on. I just was in Ghana for a university mission. We went to the University of Ghana, and we're hosting talks throughout the week uh, regarding faith, questions about faith, how can we know God is real, exists, is true, and we saw many people come to faith and putting their trust in Christ for the first time. So it's been wonderful, it's been good. Just so you know, the gospel still works, it's still powerful. People are still being saved and being added to the number of those who are trusting in Christ, so that's really, really good news uh, for us this morning. What I wanna do just before I get into what I'd like to share this morning is there's a few things that are just on my heart, even as I was worshiping there, as I've been praying for this community. It's a few things I feel like God is wanting to maybe encourage us with this morning that I feel uh, somewhat prophetically on my heart uh, for you this morning. The first thing is that I think it's so appropriate that before we start to talk about going and telling, which is gonna be the sense of my message this morning, is that we, we do that from the place of first beholding and having a sense of seeing God. We need to go from the place of beholding and seeing. And it feels like this community knows what that's about. Even looking at your rolling slides at the beginning, they're all about beholding and about seeing. And we have to go from that place. You know, Jesus said we can only serve one master. We can only have one ultimate one that we adore that sits on the throne of our hearts. And that's because the human heart has only capacity for one Lord. It, has only, it only has capacity for allegiance to one ultimate being whom we love. All of us have a Lord. Every single one of us, whether you're here checking out the claims of Christ or you're here as a Christian for a few years or many years, every single one of us has a Lord, an ultimate Lord whom we worship, the one we give our allegiance to. It's not a question of if we have a Lord, it's a question of who is our Lord or what is our Lord? Who sits on the throne of our hearts? Who are we beholding? Who are we seeing? Because the one that we orientate ourselves towards, the one that we behold, that we look at, is ultimately the one or the thing that we become like in our lives. We become what we behold. Are we beholding God? Are we holding up God as the ultimate, most beautiful treasure in our hearts? You see, we can't be sent. We can't go into all the world, as Mark chapter 16 says, and proclaim the gospel unless we have seen the one who is telling us to go unless we have seen the one who is calling us. Because if we, if we try to go and tell without first coming and seeing, we get things a little bit distorted. We don't know who's sending us. We're not quite sure of the message really that we're trying to tell. We've lost the essence of what it is we're going to even tell people. So there's two equal opposite areas that we can fall into. The one is that we can try to go and tell without first coming and seeing. And what that leads to is spiritual anemia. If you're anemic, I have experienced anemia in my life. It's an iron deficiency. It means your red blood cell count is low. There's a kind of uh, weakness about your appearance. You're, you're white. You're kind of almost translucent. Uh, so that's what anemia is. There's, a, there's a, a kind of spiritual anemia that we can experience as well. And that's when we try to go and tell, to do the things we think God uh, says we ought to do without first coming and seeing and going from that place. But there's another error that we can make. And that's the area that leads to spiritual obesity. So we can get spiritual anemia and we can get spiritual obesity. And that's what we just come and see again and again and again and again, but we never go and tell. We never, we never share what it is that God has put in us as a people, as the saints, to go and share the good news that we get to proclaim. And if we don't, if we don't go and tell, and all we do is, is feed ourselves with the incredible experience that is God's presence, if we just simply feast on his promises, which of course we need to do as God's people, but if we just stay there, we become spiritually flabby. We become a bit, uh, a bit useless, actually. 
We're not actually the people that God is preparing us to be, calling us to be. We need to be filled so that we can overflow and we can go. If you think about it in terms of uh, a dam that collects water, perhaps you've heard of this analogy. If that particular dam only has an inflow, what happens? It starts to stagnate. It starts to get a bit smelly. Life cannot form in that particular body of water. But if that dam has an inflow and an outflow, there can be freshness, there can be life. We need both. We need an outflow. So I, I believe that even though most of what I'm going to be talking about in these few days to come is about going and telling, we have to start from the place of coming and seeing. We have to start from the place of beholding God's glory and his presence. This is where we need to start from. So I don't want us to get this the wrong way around. I don't want you to hear me talking about going and telling, and uh, you think that I'm not a person who's encouraging us to come and see. We need both. We need the inflow, and we need the outflow. And there is a priority of order here. It starts with coming and seeing, and moves to going and telling. So maybe I can ask you, if you're a Christian here this morning, when was the last time you saw his glory? When was the last time you beheld the splendor of the king? Are you just going through the motions? Are you just a worshiping person who stands and sings the songs that you're used to, the words that you know? You go with the movements because you know what they are, but you're not beholding the glory of God. You're not moved by his presence within you. If you're a Christian, can I ask you, when was the last time you beheld the glory of the Lord like Isaiah? That's a perfect example of what it looks like to be a Christian. Beginning of Isaiah chapter six says, in the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. What was his response? I'm ruined. I'm absolutely ruined. He falls on his face and he says, I cannot do anything but say I'm ruined, a man of unclean lips, until God brings forgiveness and grace. And then he says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? I can just imagine Isaiah looking around going, are you kidding me? I've just seen the glory of the Lord. I've just seen uh, the God whose train of his robe fills the temple. And he's asking who he's going to send. I can imagine him looking around and going, pick me. I will go. I've seen your glory and I didn't die. So I'm going to go and tell others that they too can see your glory and live. Sometimes we have this picture of God as a taskmaster. We almost have this picture of God like a, a father who's got lots of chores for their children to do. Imagine the situation. A kid goes to a father and just wants to tell the father how much they love the father or the parent. They want to spend time with the father. But the first thing the father says to the kid is, actually, there's a whole bunch of chores I've got for you to do here. The pool has got some leaves in it. It needs some emptying. The garden needs some raking. And when you're done with that, I'll give you the next thing that you need to do. How sad it is to see God in that way. God is not a taskmaster who just has things for you and I to do. He calls us to himself first. And from the place of intimacy, sends us out to be his witnesses, co-laborers with Christ. I'm, I'm laboring this point because I want us to get it. I want us to get this. We have to behold him first. Otherwise, our message is anemic, it's weak, and our witness will not be very effective or have long-term sustenance to it. We have to behold him before we go. And something I'm sensing over this community is that God is calling you to be a seed-bearing church. He's putting seeds in the hands of so many people in this place. I had a, a picture in my time of prayer for this community of God literally putting seeds in every person's hand in this church. And he's putting you, he's bringing you into a season of going, into a season of sending, of scattering seeds of the gospel for God's glory. I believe that he wants to do this. I believe that he wants this community to be a center, a center of renewal, that many are going to go from this place with the message of the gospel. Many are going to hear about Jesus because of those in this community. So I want us to have faith. I want us to join our hearts to, to this message, to the season of being sent of going in the name of Jesus. Is that okay? I mean, is that, is that an exciting thing as a community, hopefully, to join our hearts with? Why don't I just pray for us for a second that God would, over the course of these next few days and up to the sending that's happening in a few months, that he would start to 
put his heart in us to behold, to come and see, and to go and tell. Let's pray for a moment. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you that you are a God who calls us first to come and see your glory. We think of the apostle John's words who said, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten son, full of grace and truth. And I ask that even now by your Holy Spirit that you would come and help us to see Jesus this morning, the glory of the only begotten son. And from that place, would you send us out in the power of the Holy Spirit to carry the seeds of the gospel, to be people of the renewal of the kingdom. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. All right, that wasn't any of that wasn't really planned, but there we go. That's some, those are some things that I have on my heart. And what I want to not miss is that sense of coming and seeing before we go and tell. But I am going to spend the majority of this message talking about going and telling, the call to go, sharing our faith boldly with those around us, having a deep confidence in the gospel. One of the things I've realized as I travel around and speak to different people about Jesus and go to different churches and meet Christians is that they have a lot of confidence for the gospel in the gospel for themselves. They have a confidence that it works. They've experienced the power of it in their own lives. But when it comes to sharing with people around them, they don't have as much confidence. They kind of stall and stumble and wonder, does the gospel really work? Does this person really need the gospel? Should I share it with them? What if they don't want it? What if they don't need it? I'm hoping that this morning what's going to happen is that we're going to renew our confidence in the gospel as God's power to save, a message that every single person in all creation needs to hear. So if you've got a Bible, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 15 in 1 Peter chapter 3. That's going to be our text for the next few minutes, next 20 or so minutes together. Right, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, the Apostle Peter writing to dispersed uh, community in the persecution says this, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. I'm going to read that again. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. There's three things I want to talk about um, as we look at this text together. The first is that everyone gets to play. The second is that we are to have a confidence in the gospel. And the third is that we are to prepare ourselves to share the gospel with those around us. So firstly, everyone gets to play. This is a phrase from John Wimber who started the Vineyard Movement. And his whole point when he was talking about this particular phrase is that it's not about the super saints. It's not about the super evangelists. It's not about the super apostles. It's not about those who are super spiritual. It's about every single person, every single person who calls on the name of Christ, joining themselves to the move of God and to the movement of God in spreading the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. This is for every single one of us who call ourselves Christians. That is the truth. Peter writing this letter, if you go right back to the beginning in chapter 1, verse 1, you'll see the verses come up. He says, this is addressed to all of God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, and the rest. This is not a letter to church leaders. That is my point. This is a letter to every single believer, every person who calls themselves a follower of the Lord Jesus. So when Peter is writing these verses, always be ready to share. Don't think that's the evangelist's job. Don't think that's the job of the person on the stage who's gifted to hold a microphone. Don't think this is the super apostle's job. This is your job, and this is my job. Every single person. Now, the reality is that there is a particular kind of gift, right? Ephesians chapter 4, we know it. There's the office of the evangelist, capital E. And these are particular people who are called as evangelists to this office to build up the saints for works of service. 
Not all of us are going to be called to be evangelists in that sense, but every single Christian is called to evangelism. Every single Christian is called to be a witness to the Lord Jesus in his world and to what he is doing. This is a really key distinction for us to make, the difference between the office of the evangelist and the call to be a witness. All of us are called to be a witness. But if you're anything like me, there are lots of reasons that jump to mind right now as to why you would exclude yourself from this call. Lots of reasons. Perhaps you can think about a failure that you just experienced a few days ago in trying to communicate the gospel. Perhaps you are thinking about a sin that you haven't been able to overcome in your life just yet. Perhaps you sinned this morning, and as I'm talking about this, you're thinking, I'm so woefully disqualified uh, to, let alone behold, to go and tell those who are around me about who Jesus is. I remember I was in the UK, and uh, I was just trying to get to grips with what it looks like to be a witness to Jesus and to let my life be a witness to Jesus. And I thought, well, what this means is that it needs to happen wherever I go. Okay, so I'm going to a hairdresser. I decided to get a haircut, and I thought, this is a great opportunity to be a witness. This person can go nowhere for 30 minutes as I get my haircut. So here we go. We start to have a conversation, and... uh, We start talking about Jesus, and I start sharing the gospel with him, and it's going really well. But then we get to the end of the haircuts, and we haven't got to the end of the conversation. I've got to go and draw money, so I get to an ATM, and as I'm drawing the money, I say, Lord, help me to share the gospel and to invite this person into more conversation. As I get back to the hairdresser, and I'm handing over the money to him, I hear myself saying something like this. You know, it's been such a great time uh, this morning. I've really enjoyed our conversation. It's something I'd love to continue. I'd love to keep talking to you. Maybe there's a time that we can get together and we can talk a bit more about this and we can have more time together. And I realized it sounded like I was asking him on a date. (laughs) And as I realized this, I panicked, handed over the money and just walked out the salon and continued on my merry way. I absolutely failed in in that experience of, of sharing the gospel with someone, I felt so incredibly inadequate after that moment. Can I tell you a secret? No one feels adequate to share the gospel. No one. Not even me whose job it is to share the gospel wherever I go. I don't feel adequate to do it. I don't feel perfect enough in my speech, in my ability, in my conversation to be able to consistently do this day in and day out all the time. No one feels qualified. Not even the Apostle Paul. Do you know what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16? He said, who's sufficient for these things? Who's sufficient to tell of the glory of the gospel? Who? But he goes on in chapter 3 to say, our sufficiency comes from God. Who's sufficient for these things? No one. Who feels qualified and adequate to do this? No one. But our sufficiency comes from him, and so we have confidence to speak. So we have confidence to share. You see, not feeling sufficient does not equal being ashamed of the gospel. I want to say that again. Not feeling sufficient is not the same as being ashamed of the gospel. Because the same apostle who said, who's sufficient, also said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for the salvation of all those who believe. And so he went everywhere trying to explain, demonstrate, and share the gospel of Christ. No one feels sufficient. But this is for you. And this is for me. And this is the call that we have. Can I encourage you? Just make a start. Just start. Begin at the beginning. Start with the best, uh, most easy option that you can think of when it comes to sharing with someone around you. Take the low-hanging fruit. Just make a start. John chapter 9, we see a great example of what it looks like to grow as a witness. There's a man who's born blind. Jesus comes and heals him as a demonstration of what he's just taught before, of his being the light of the world. He says, I'm the light of the world. Then we see the Pharisees and the Jews rejecting him, showing that they are actually blind. Jesus then demonstrates his ability to give sight and to be the light by opening up the eyes of a man who's born blind. This man is called before the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, and they say, what has happened to you? Who did this? And he's just become a Christian, so to speak. How does he begin to witness? He says, Hey, I can't say much. 
I don't quite know what's happened, but this man, Jesus, he's done something. That's all I can tell you. That's all he has. That's the first step. This man, Jesus, he has done something in my life. But he goes on. He begins to grow as a witness. Later on in that same chapter, in John chapter 9, he said, this man, he's a prophet. He's beginning to come to grips with the identity of Jesus and to share that with even those in uh, spiritual authority. He moves on to say, if this man was not from God, he could do nothing. Can you see the growth? He starts and says, I don't know, Jesus, this dude, he's done something, he's great, you should try him. He goes on to say, he's a prophet. And he finishes by saying, if he was not from God, he could do nothing. And he worships him a few verses later. Just make a start. This is for you. This is for me. This is for us. And until we recognize that every single one of us are called to be witnesses, this call to go is going to be impotent. Because we're going to expect someone else to do it. We're going to expect the pastors to do it. We're going to expect the evangelists to do it. Until we realize this is for us, the call to go is impotent. So make a start. So firstly, what we see is everyone gets to play. Secondly, what we see is that we are to have a confidence in the gospel. We are to have a deep-rooted confidence in this message that we believe is true for us and that everyone needs to hear. We see this, we see this in the proclamation that Jesus is Lord, Peter says in verse 15. Set apart in your heart Christ as Lord. We need to have confidence in the identity of Christ as Lord. You know, our culture is currently in a truth crisis right now. 2016, the word of the year was post-truth. Do you know that? The word of the year globally from the Oxford English Dictionary was post-truth. What that means is that we no longer have any confidence that there is such a thing as truth. We cannot come to agreement. We can't even feel confident to say anything with certainty because we're worried that we'll be shut down as a bigot. No truth exists any longer. I was talking to someone, uh, I, I happen to do this wherever I go, which is a goal, but I was running a, a cross-country race uh, in the UK and uh, I went up a hill and I thought this was a great time to ask someone about Jesus. So I started asking him, that meant that he had to talk up a hill and I could just carry on. And uh, he, he said to me, oh, that's great, but if it works for you, that's great, but it doesn't necessarily have to work for someone else. There's no such thing as truth, really. And I said to him, is it true that there's no such thing as truth? Is it true that there is no such thing as truth? And he looked at me and he thought, hmm, that's a bit of a tough one to get around. The fact is, truth is inescapable. Anytime you make a statement of absolute, that carries absolute weight, you're making a truth claim statement. We cannot get away from truth, and we cannot get away from our need for truth. We can't get away from it. And Christianity, at its core, brings truth in it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. See, when our culture is looking for propositions to believe, we're offering a person who is truth. He is himself truth. Pilate asks the wrong question in John chapter 19. He says, what is truth? Not realizing that the who of truth is standing right in front of him. He missed the person of truth. When we are offering truth, we are offering a person who makes sense, illuminates, explains all of life better than any other claim that we could make. C.S. Lewis was once asked, did you come to Christianity? He was an atheist. Did you come to Christianity because it made you happier than all of the other religions that you could have chosen from. And he said with characteristic C.S. Lewis intelligence, no, 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 I didn't come to Christianity to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port could do that. I came to Christianity because I believe it's true. The only reason to believe in Christianity is because we believe it's true. The Apostle Paul said, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, let's, let's eat, drink, and be merry. Let's go do whatever we want. It doesn't matter. See, there's no value in following Christian belief, in following Christian morals, if it's just about an outward form of morality that has hope only for this life. If it's not true, let's go do something else on a Sunday morning. 
Let's go for breakfast somewhere else. Let's go ride our bikes. Let's go surf in the swell. Let's go do something else. But if it's true, we have something powerful to offer the world today. We have the truth of an everlasting relationship with an eternal God who, whose purpose it is to renew all of heaven and earth. And he wants to use us in the process of renewal. Isn't that powerful? We have something of truth. The gospel is not just good news. It's true good news. It's true good news. And we need to have confidence in the truth of the gospel. But we also need confidence in the content of the gospel. What is it? How do we share it? Are we familiar with the truths in the gospel as shown to us in the person of Jesus and in the scriptures who tell us about him? Are we confident in that? See, Peter says in verse 15, you need to set apart in your heart Christ as Lord. That's where it starts. If you're here checking out the claims of Christ today and you're wondering where it starts, that's where it starts. Setting apart in your heart Christ as Lord. And if you're a Christian, that's not just a one-time thing that you do. We set apart Christ as Lord in our heart in every area, every day, in finances, in our family, in our decisions with what we do with our lives. You know, I heard one person say to me when I was um, talking about Christianity, we we're talking about the difference between the sense of rights that our culture talks about and how Christianity views that. This person said to me, Christians don't have rights, they have obedience. Christians don't have rights, they have obedience. But the thing is in the Christian faith, obedience to him as Lord leads to freedom because we're following the designer's design. If you wanna know how something works best, you go to the blueprint. You go to the one who has designed it, who knows how it functions best. So when we're talking about obedience to the Lord, setting him apart as Lord in our heart, we're not talking about killing joy. We're not talking about uh, pouring water on freedom. We're talking about true freedom. We're talking about the blueprint of the designer that as we follow it, we find the, the essence of what it means to be a created being in God's good world. Let's come to him as Lord. He is the Lord at the center of the gospel. The scriptures testify to this. Do you know that when you're holding uh, this book in your hands, this Bible, that it is historically reliable, that it's not just something that encourages Christians, but is one of the greatest historical artifacts that we have, historically reliable artifacts that we have? Within 65 years of Jesus' death and resurrection, every single letter we have in the New Testament was written already. That's within the first generation, all written by eyewitnesses, disciples of eyewitnesses, and careful first century historians. That's what we have in this New Testament that testifies about Jesus within 65 years of his death and his resurrection, which basically refutes the claim that this is some kind of folk that was, or a myth that was created later. I heard someone say to me recently, yeah, Constantine put the Bible together in the fourth century. I can't believe that. That is so historically inaccurate that I didn't even know where to begin to respond to this particular claim. And the person had just picked it up somewhere and had no clue of the source for it, but, but had actually never investigated the historical accuracy of this book that we hold. Within 65 years, those who had walked with, who had talked with, who had witnessed Jesus' life, what he did, what he taught. That is what we are reading. Compare that with biographies of St. Muhammad, which was uh, written 125 years after his death with 50 years further editing after that. Alexander the Great, the best source that we have is 400 years after his life. Buddha, 350 years after his life. Jesus, within 65 years, everything we have in the New Testament is written. We have a powerful source of truth right here. You can have confidence that when you're reading this, it gives you a great description of who Christ is and what that means for our life and our world. Read it. Read your Bible. Get to know it. Study it. Memorize it. Understand the hope of the message within it. Share it with those around you. I need to hurry up. Let me move on. So we need a confidence in the content of the gospel. And we need a confidence to engage with neighbors and our surrounding culture. Peter says something really challenging. He says, always be prepared. 
when someone asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have within you. Can I ask you, when's the last time someone asked you for the reason you hope you have, with, the reason for the hope you have within you? Can you recall it? Where your life was such that someone had to stop and say, what's this hope about? What, what is it that you believe? When was the last time someone asked you? And were you prepared to answer? Peter says, always be prepared. Not just on a one occasion or one type of occasion, but in every single instance, be prepared. What a challenge for us to do. And different contexts and different people are gonna require different kinds of responses. We need to gauge what we say based on the person or the context that is in front of us. I'm not gonna go through these references, but perhaps the slide can come up and you can, you can go through them for yourself. They're just different examples of how people in the scriptures have related to different contexts differently and brought the message differently depending on that context. Peter's proclamation to the Jews in Acts 2, Paul's proclamation to the Greeks in Acts chapter 17, and then his proclamation, Paul's, to the Romans in Acts 24 to 26. Go and have a look at how they bring those different, uh, how they bring the message in a different way depending on context. It's a very powerful thing for us to understand. One question I find very helpful that you can ask someone is if they come to you and they say, well, I'm not quite sure why I don't believe, but I don't believe, a question you can ask them back is, what for you is the main thing that keeps you from putting your trust in Christ? What is the main reason you haven't put your trust in Christ? That gets to the heart of it, and we can begin to approach from understanding the heart of the barrier to belief. A powerful strategy that we can use in this process is outlined by an uh, incredible uh, French mathematician called Blaise Pascal. I don't know if you've heard of Blaise Pascal, Pascal's wager maybe you've heard of. He said this, in our approach to sharing the gospel, we need to make people wish it were true and then show them that it is. Make people wish it were true and then show them that it is. Help them to wish that everything we're saying about Jesus were actually true. Show the beauty of the gospel. Show how it's relevant to their life every single day. Get a sense of resonance within the person you're talking to and then tell them it is, in fact, true. So we need to have a confidence in the gospel. And finally, we need to be prepared to share the gospel. We need to prepare ourselves. How are some of the ways that we can do that? Well, let me just go through three or four quick ways. I'm not gonna be longer than a few minutes. I only have a few left. One of the things I've realized is that it's not unbelievers who are closed to uh, hearing the gospel. It's Christians who are closed to sharing it. It's Christians who are closed to sharing it. We have a world that is starving for the truth of the gospel, and Christians are so scared about being slighted. They're so scared about saying the wrong thing. They're so scared about having a question asked to them that they cannot respond, that they say nothing. It's Christians who are closed, not unbelievers. I was sitting in Wales once with a guy covered head to toe in pottery clay. He had been working with ceramics, he was a student, and we're giving a talk in a bar on campus. I'd just given a talk, and he was uh, looking like he was really engaged. And so I went up to him afterwards and said, hey, you look like you were enjoying that, what was going on? And he said to me, wow, I did not know that this was what Christianity was really about. No one's ever told me that this is what it was really like. I was like, yeah, it's pretty great, isn't it? And he said, it's amazing, covered in pottery, clay, ceramics, just listening, smiling at me. And I said to him, we talked for 45 minutes, and I said to him, would you be comfortable for us to pray? And he said, yeah, sure, let's pray together. Not a believer, uh, he wanted to pray. And there was a moment of silence, and I said, would you be comfortable to pray? Not a believer. He said, yes, I'd be comfortable to pray. So we bow our heads, we close our eyes, there's silence, and he looks at me and he says, what do I say? <laughs> he had never prayed before. He had never, never been led to pray, never been led to address God. And I said to him, why don't you say something like this? God, if you're there, 
I'd really like to know about it. Amen. Can't we ask people to pray a simple prayer like that? An agnostic's prayer? You know what he ended up doing? He ended up praying for two minutes. He ended up thanking God for the day, thanking God for the weather, thanking God for the talk. He put some Christians to shame with how long he prayed. People are open. Are you? Are you open? Are you open to sharing? It starts with being open. But secondly, maybe I can challenge you to do this as you think of preparing yourself. Write down five to ten questions you would most like not to be asked. Not to be asked. Like, like it terrifies you and leads you to cold sweats when you think about being asked these questions. Why am I asking you to do that? Because those are the questions people are probably going to ask you. Are you ready? Peter says, be ready. Loving your neighbor, mean, part of that means taking seriously the questions that act as barriers to belief. How are we loving our neighbor? By thinking through their questions lovingly and diligently so that we can respond and help them to see Christ. Removing that barrier so that they can see him clearly. Last thing I'll say and then I'll finish is perhaps a strategy that you can adopt is a strategy that a guy called J. John says we can do. He says there's a three-pronged approach. One, it starts with praying. Secondly, we move to caring. And thirdly, we move to sharing. Pray. God, give me opportunities. God, give me an opening with this family member. Help me to love them. Help me to share boldly when the opportunity is right. Help me to do it with gentleness and respect. Secondly, we need to care. Actually care about what people are saying to you. It's not about closing a deal. There is no closing deals because that just dehumanizes a person. We need to value them and their questions. We need to care about their lives. Lastly, share. Don't neglect on the sharing part of this process. Don't just care and show that you're a loving person. Uh, actually share the gospel with those around you. So as we think about the call to go, we're remembering that this is for us. We're remembering that this is a call that comes to every single person that calls themselves a believer. And we need to realize that it's time to regain a confidence in the gospel. It actually works. People actually need it. And we need to learn how to prepare ourselves to share that. Can I ask us to stand as we finish, ask the band to come up? I want to just lead us in a brief time of prayer and then maybe a song or two to close. Why don't we close our eyes together? Perhaps you're here this morning and you're back in church after a long time or you have never put your faith in Christ at all or you've realized that you thought you had but you never met the person. You never met the person of Jesus, the person who is truth. I'd love to pray for you first. If, if that's you, can I, can I ask you to respond to God this morning, not to me? but to what God is doing in your life, in your heart, and calling you back to himself. As every eye is closed, can you just, can you make that response to God? I wanna pray a very simple prayer. You can follow along after me under your breath in your own heart. I'm not gonna draw public attention to you, but I would love to lead you in this moment. So if that's you, if you wanna to respond to God for the first time or come back to him after a long time of being away. Can you pray this simple prayer? God, thank you for speaking to me this morning. Thank you, Jesus, that you are truth. Thank you that you meet me where I am. God, would you pull me close again? Thank you that I am now yours. Thank you that you have forgiven my sins, past, present, and future. And you have adopted me into your family. You have poured out your Holy Spirit into my heart. Thank you that I am yours today, God. Amen. Why don't we celebrate together for those that have uh, prayed that prayer. Why don't we give a round of applause to those who have prayed.
moment, if we can just close our eyes again, I wanna pray for the Christians. The reality is that we are so woefully unprepared for this mission and this call unless we have the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God, Jesus said, who will come upon us so that we can be his witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, to the ends of the earth. So come Holy Spirit, right now would you, would you blow through this place. Thank you that you bring fire for the mission. Thank you that you bring power for service, that you equip your church with gifts, good gifts, so that we might build up each other and that we might reach a lost world. So would you come now, Holy Spirit, and start to commission people again across this room. Lord, we have beheld your glory this morning in worship. We ask now that you would help us to go and tell, that you would fill us with your fire to go and tell. God, it's when your Holy Spirit came upon those early disciples that spontaneous spirit-driven evangelism resulted. 3,000 were added in one sitting, 10% of an entire city. Lord, what would happen if we were filled with the Spirit similarly? What kind of witnesses could we be in Jeffreys Bay, in South Africa, in the world? So would you come and commission right now? Would you just, if that's you and you're feeling a fresh call to go, if you're wanting fresh confidence to go, would you open up your hands now and invite the Holy Spirit to come? He's already here. He's already here. But invite Him to empower you freshly. Even now, just sense the Spirit moving across the room, opening up people's hearts again to the gospel, to its power. Thank you for fresh power today, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for pouring out of your love into hearts by the Holy Spirit. Thank you for fresh glimpses of your glory that lead us to go. Come, Holy Spirit, fill this place. Fill this place. Fill your people that we would be effective witnesses to the gospel in Jesus' name for his sake. Move in this place where tongues of fire come again on your people that we would be bold in witnessing to your name. Let's carry this through into this next song. Let's seek God. Let's ask him for his power and his presence to be his witness.